morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Time is now 947, <coughs> and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Ed meeting of April 13th, 2010 is called to order. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda in order of priority. I have a motion, please. So moved. Second. Nancy, supported by Cassandra. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you. Uh, introductions. Eileen Hamilton, please. Good morning. I'm trying to get some computers running, so I will just move ahead and work around the table first. Uh, at the head of the table and chairman of the State Board of Education is Mr. Mike Flanagan, the superintendent of public instruction. Next to Mr. Flanagan is Mrs. Kathleen Strauss from Detroit, president of the board. Next to Mrs. Strauss is Mr. John Austin from Ann Arbor, vice president. Next is Mrs. Carolyn Curtin from Everett, Board Secretary. Next is Mrs. Marianne Yard McGuire from Detroit. She's the treasurer of the board. Um, the empty chair is that of Naya Harden. Naya represents Governor Granholm at the table, and she will be joining us via the telephone uh, shortly. Next is Rob Stevenson, uh, the 2009-10 Michigan Teacher of the Year. Uh, when he's in the classroom, he's a third grade teacher at Wardcliffe Elementary School in Okemos. And you may know he's the famous guy from the Lansing State <laughs> Journal <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> that was the one with the sticker on my face. Right. <laughs> and even today, there's oh, another the little uh, oh, piece today. Oh, it's fabulous. Oh, it is. Yeah. You. you can pass oh, that around the table. We're very proud of you, Rob. Thank you. Oh boy. Moving across the table, <coughs> the table is Cassandra Albridge from Rochester Hills. Uh, next is. <laughs> you're throwing me off, Liz. Uh, the empty chair, chair is that of Reginald Turner from Detroit, and um, I understand Mr. Turner will be joining us here shortly. Next is Mrs. Elizabeth Bauer from Birmingham, and next is Mrs. Nancy Danhoff from East Lansing, and Mrs. Danhoff represents the board as its delegate to the National Association of State Boards of Education. Department of Education staff, Sally Vaughn, Chief Academic Officer and Deputy Superintendent, Carol Wollenberg, Deputy Superintendent, Martin Ackley, Director of Communications, Andrea Post, Administrative Aide to the Superintendent, Lisa Hansconnect, Legislative Director, Lindy Bush, Director, Early Childhood Education and Family Services, Marianne Chartrand, Director, Grants Coordination and School Support, <coughs> Mary Alice Galloway, Director, Education Improvement <coughs> and Innovation, Flora Jenkins, Director, Office of Professional Preparation. Any other directors here? Rick. Oh, Rick, I'm sorry. <laughs> Rick Floria, Director of Financial Management. Uh, some of our guests with us today, Diane McMillan, representing the Michigan Association of Secondary School Principals. Bruce Fay, Wayne Risa, Casey Kefkin, Michigan Middle Cities Education Association, Terrence Lunger, Superintendent Calhoun ISD, Pat McNeil, Michigan Association for Curriculum and Staff Development, Judy Pritchett, Macomb Intermediate School District, Dan Quisenberry, Michigan Association of Public School Academies, and Billy Wimmer, Michigan Council of Charter School Authorizers. Oh, I see Dave Michelson from the MEA came in. I missed him. They took your seat, huh, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Move to the right or the left. I'm not sure. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. And all the rest of you who were not acknowledged, we're glad you're here today. This is just our more formal announcements that Eileen makes. And speaking of today, I mean, we have a lot of folks, my colleagues here at the department are here because of a very special time each year when we <coughs> give a very special award. And I'm going to turn it over to Board President Kathleen Strauss to make that announcement. Well, thank you very much. This is always one of the most pleasant things we do with the, at the board. We we really enjoy this. Uh, we're going to present the Stella Geekus Award uh, for staff excellence, support staff excellence. Um, it's it's a, such a pleasure because we get so many wonderful nominees. But let me say a word first about Stella. She was the recording secretary of the state board uh, when she, uh, in 1991, she closed what she, her last stenographer's notebook. They don't do that anymore. <laughs> but she kept it all in a notebook after 47 years at the Department of Education. 
She passed away in 1991, shortly after <coughs> that, and um, she had bone cancer. But she also, she, she always combined the highest level of professional competence and achievement with the highest level of common sense, and she had great people skills. So she served under no less than 11 superintendents. And she really ran the place, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing's changed, trust me. <laughs> she was the super secretary who ev others all aspired to be like her. She was a role model for role models. Well, uh, after she died in 1991, the State Board of Education approved the establishment of the Stella Gikas Award uh, Secretarial Award, it was called then. Now we renamed it to the Stella Gikas Professional Support Staff uh, Excellence Award. <coughs> and it's given annually to an outstanding support person in the Department of Education. And we are blessed with many absolutely unbelievable people who are our support staff, who really are marvelous. Uh, the award is given for providing leadership to others outstanding service to education, dedication to excellence, and maintaining the very highest professional standards. We have a subcommittee every year, and this year it was composed of Carolyn Curtin, um, Jean Shane, I don't know if Jean is in the room, I assume she is someplace. <laughs> oh, there she is, okay. Uh, Jean Shane, uh, Eileen Hamilton, uh, Linda Bouchang, who was our uh, award winner last year, and me. Uh, we reviewed the nominations for this year's award and it was, it's always difficult to pick just one because all the nominations are, nominees are great. But this year we picked a wonderful, wonderful person who's been here in the department for more than 20 years. Uh, she's a secretary in the Office of Early Childhood Education and Family Services and those folks really think very highly of her. It is Joyce Gooder. Some of the comments that, that uh, the nomination contained. <coughs> this gooder exem exemplifies an unwavering dedication to excellence on a daily basis. She continuously demonstrates her stellar professional work ethics on a daily basis. This is two different ones. Basis in part with the extremely high quality products which she produces, her excellent customer service that she provides to callers, visitors, her attention to detail as the unit's timekeeper and her ability to anticipate the needs of and support for the unit staff. She fully understands her role as an essential member of a work team and uses this understanding to ensure what she does on a daily basis from professional, compassionate customer service on citizen and school entities phone calls to utilizing her outstanding editing and proofreading ability to support staff work products is done on the highest level at the highest quality uh, and contributes to delivering the highest quality early education programs to the children and families of Michigan. Ms. Gooder not only works hard displaying qualities of a highly functioning, dedicated worker, but also models those qualities to other staff. She does not ask others to do what she is not willing to do herself. Another one says, Mrs. Gooder showcases her leadership to others beyond the unit an office for which she is responsible for supporting by leading many successful ev uh, events of the wellness team for the department, 
even if she is not in the lead role of planning, organizing, and executing the event, or logistically carrying out the program, she dedicates her time and effort without hesitation for the better betterment of her co-workers and other department staff. Mrs. Gooda truly goes above and beyond in her position at the department, but she doesn't stop showcasing the type of person she is when she leaves for the day. For years, she has participated in the Big Brothers Big Sisters program by being a big sister and mentoring a young girl. She also gives back to society through her participation in the Race for the Cure annual events and organizes sponsoring uh, organized the sponsoring of two Salvation Army families by the Office of Early Childhood Education and Family Services each Christmas. She really wow. is terrific <laughs> with a capital <laughs> T. And we are very proud of you and very grateful for your support and your help and your contribution. Oh, thank you so much. So. I appreciate this. It's quite an honor considering the caliber of people we have here in the department, and I really appreciate this honor. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd like to introduce my family. This is my husband, Phil, and my oldest daughter, Angie Kapolaski. She's a teacher in Port here in high school. My daughter, Erin Lazorek, she's a social worker in Grand Rapids. And my son-in-law, Brian Lazorek, and he also lives with my daughter, Erin. <laughs> that when I showed up here about 16 years ago as a brand new consultant, scared to death, I got um, assigned in April to be the, um, our unit at that time's representative to the Month of the Young Child and a big celebration at the state capitol. And I had to do an activity for children. And nobody volunteered to help me but Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> came that day and we looked at each other, we were dressed identically. <laughs> in much of the young child clothes. And I never forgot that she not only was dedicated to doing the work here, but that she understood the purpose of it for children and families in Michigan. And she has always been a supporter of that. And we do really Go and fix another way. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, we're going to, um, Marty Ackley is going to do a point of the day for us. Now that we've had the highlight of the day already, we'll. Right. <laughs> Everything else we do today will be a tough act. Right. Oh my gosh, she's well, on a day like this. <laughs> perfect <laughs> oh, reading day. A day I like to curl up with my favorite book and box of crayons. <laughs> but this is a new technology. This is an iPad. <laughs> Belongs to Mike Flaminio, who is our webmaster and our technology genius. He's got an iPad. And what my point of the day is the fact that this is his son Ben. He's 19 months old, and he is using the iPad. Mike downloaded the cat in the hat. The mm. cat in the hat. Dr. Seuss. This is interactive technology, interactive learning, which is the way our children are going to be learning today, tomorrow, and into the future. Five years from now, this is going to be antiquated technology. But for now, this is the way that kids can learn, even 19-month-old children. You can either have the book read to you, you can read it read to you. And not interactive because if the child pushes, sit. <laughs> Cold. Hmm. So oh. all we could do was to sit. Okay. And, sit. and then you. 19 months old to teach it how yeah. to Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they can learn to read, learn to. <coughs> When they push on something, fish. it spells fish and it says fish. Jump. Jump. Okay. And also, they can uh, read it themselves. They can read it by themselves or they can push on it and it will read it for them. How about other languages? I don't know if it has that. Oh. <laughs> 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 That's in five right. years. It's not my yet. application yeah. area. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the new technology. This is the way children are going to be learning right. today, tomorrow, and in the future. <laughs> so I think that it's important for us to recognize um, the new technology and to prepare our schools to start teaching this way because whether we like it or not, this is the way children are learning today and in the future. And that's my point of the day. Thank you. Thank you. And that's one reason I'm, I'm really appreciative of the different divisions. If you remember, we didn't have any new money to build the technology division uh, the first year I was here. So I asked folks through the rest of the department to give up part of their money, in effect, in order to build one. And, and Bruce and company are really helping lead us into this new world. It started back when I think Liz was the one before my time that led a board-led committee on technology. and got us thinking in those respects, but uh, we've now institutionalized it, and as Marty said, this is really where we're going, and one of the difficulties of being an adult is we can't, it's hard to relate to that, at least for me, and, and you know, and it's going to be hard for us to understand the way young people, like Mike's child, our grandchild, is going to learn, and the way their brains are going to be wired differently. Um, so we've got to be re really thoughtful of teaching techniques and the rest as we and reinvent the learning and teaching process. Well, we're going to go right to, um, I think I think John's going to kick this go. off, as I understand I'm going to say something first. And then Kathy's going to kick this off, as I said. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, you know, I, I don't want to say this. I, I, I can't tell you how proud I am 
that the board has taken on this initiative that you're going to hear more about today. As you know, it's, it, there's been a number of uh, meetings in advance of this, and so I'll let Kathy describe some of that for you. Well, as you all know, we have had a series of meetings uh, one of which we have presenters talk to us, economists, educators, business representatives, labor representatives, uh, citizens, uh, telling us we know we're in a crisis in the state. Maybe it's a, it's a long-term crisis, actually. Uh, and we, we have to solve it because we have to keep education at the forefront of what we do in the state. It's what we need to build our economy, to build our future, to educate our children, to keep our society going, to maintain our democracy. It's absolutely essential that we maintain a strong public education system. And how do we do it in the current economic situation we find ourselves in? So we have had all these presentations and we've tried to come to, we've tried to figure out what we can agree to as a board in a bipartisan fashion that we can make recommendations to the governor and the legislature <coughs> to help resolve the problem and put education on a sound footing for the future. So John has really taken the lead in uh, putting this together and uh, gathering our views and seeing if we have reached some consensus and that's what we're gonna try to do today. Uh, we have a piece prepared uh, with the help of public sector consultants and uh, uh, Michigan Future, He's, they've really put together a paper for us to use as a basis for discussion, <coughs> and that's what John is going to present to us today, and we go from there. So thank you very much, John. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Kathy, and, and thank everyone. Um, I mean, as Kathy said, it is so important that we as a board and our superintendent, we I think enhance and um, contribute to, and I hope broaden and deepen this decision making in this state about what we really need to do to support the education system that we must have and need if we're going to thrive. And uh, I hope we can uh, contribute to a more meaningful and then a more effective debate uh, by bringing together both the analysis and the recommendations that we'll walk through today. Um, as Kathy indicated, you know, we heard from starting last fall with that first panel of um, Lou Glazer, Phil Power, and Patrick Anderson, and we continued to try to digest and listen to and talk to uh, leadership groups, <coughs> economists of all stripes, ideological stripes, uh, the SOS group, the business leaders from Michigan. We visited with the State Chamber of Commerce, uh, both teachers' unions. We both talked to publicly. We heard from here and privately, um, as well as uh, our combined education stakeholders, the SOS group, and, and many, many others in terms of what their ideas are, what their recommendations are, how they understand the issues around how we uh, finance and uh, support an education system uh, in Michigan, given where we are. Um, we also talked, Kathy and I and others, with some of our legislative leaders uh, as they are working or rummaging on how to solve this problem. Um, so I want to walk you through <laughs> this framework, which is a draft framework, but also, you know, you all contributed to this. Uh, as we know, we had some good public, but very thorough discussions about uh, these topics uh, over the last month. Uh, a lot of the ideas in here are from you, uh, and a lot of the good ideas and new ideas are, came out of those discussions as well as all that we've heard from everybody. Uh, I also very much want to um, thank uh, Lou Glazer, who facilitated some of that and who contributed to uh, sort of the synthesis document. And over the last month, um, Public Sector Consultants has pro bono uh, provided a lot of help to try to digest and analyze and uh, provide some credible sort of budget estimates of what uh, the pieces of the puzzle would cost. And Jeff Williams, who couldn't be here, but Armin Ratchian and Emily Hauk are here. I really appreciate their help, and we all should um, uh, in trying to put together some some solid uh, numbers into this framework. Um, so <coughs> this is about what the education system is that we need and how we need to rearrange money and priorities in the state. And I want to sort of emphasize we are spending a lot of money in a lot of different ways, and we are short of money. But uh, the main effort is to rearrange our priorities so that we are delivering 
the outcomes and providing the education system that can help our citizens, our children, our adults compete and thrive. So there is a document, and I'm going to uh, <coughs> talk you through it in the form of this PowerPoint, but it doesn't do justice to some of the um, more detailed pieces, and I'll try to um, focus you on a couple of the tables in here as we go ahead. But first, you know, th we heard from the get-go with, with our panels and e economists and policy analysts this overwhelming case for education of how it is in this economic situation we're in. It is the only way Michigan, its people, and our state will succeed economically in this new global knowledge economy. Uh, for individuals, those with higher education attainment uh, can earn a decent living, uh, make double the amount of money that you can with just a high school degree. That wasn't always the case in Michigan. As we know, it used to be you could leave high school, walk down the street, and get a good job in the plant or the factory, and that is over. Uh, so the human opportunity for individuals by making sure they have higher and more fulsome education attainment is profound. And also, as a state, the states that have the best educated people are the places where the economy is happening and where they're the richest states now. And Michigan used to be one of those richest states. We are not. Uh, the, of the top states with the highest education attainment levels, they're the ones with the highest per capita incomes. Uh, we're now 34th in education attainment and 37th in our per capita income, uh, which is not where we're used to be and not where we need to be. I think from the beginning presentation, you know, you heard from uh, known Democrats, you know, Lou Glazer and probably economists like Charlie Bauer, who are viewed as uh, uh, more liberal, and you heard from Patrick Anderson and the business leaders from Michigan. We are killing uh, the engines of our economy, our priorities, when we're paying more for corrections than higher ed, when we're dismantling, you know, one of the best higher education systems on earth, when we're not providing the basic support or investing or finding the way to invest in things like early childhood, which remember Tim Bardick's presentation three to one long-term economic development benefits from investing in early childhood. And so what I hope we can do is, is look at, and what we as a board have, I hope, come to, to understand is how we put together the education system we need and also then, you know, how we pay for it and how we, we make it happen. On page two of this uh, document is a set of uh, uh, principles that are in draft for, for us to consider as our guides and our state's guides for how do we consider this um, topic of uh, restructuring uh, our education system with, uh, and rearranging our financial priorities? Um, equitable, equitable, we want an education system that provides uh, comparable uh, support wherever, wherever you are in the state and, and whatever color of your skin. Um, we definitely need an education system that is funded in a way that's predictable and durable and that we're not cutting it out halfway through the year or that right now, as I think we heard from our economist friends, uh, even as the Michigan economy has been tanking or now maybe beginning to come back, funding for education has been falling faster because it's not linked to the economy in a way that would allow it to least keep pace, whether the economy is going up or down. Um, holistic, I mean, one of the things that I was delighted that we came together on is we need an education system that is a continuum, that is a lifelong learning system. We need to uh, care about early childhood, K-12, and higher ed, and adults who need a higher level of education. And that's the education system that we need uh, and have to support for success. Uh, we are in tough budget times. Um, everybody has lost money, lost jobs, lost income, and we have to share the sacrifice of how we find the money to rearrange our priorities to invest in the things, perhaps, that are worth investing in. Um, we need a modern education system, and what do we mean by a 21st century system? You know, well, the, you know, the obvious example is the system was designed when a township in every school because we were all living on farms and small villages and we had Jeffersonian democracy, and you know, the world has changed. So we need to think about consolidation and sharing and integrating services at broader levels. We need to uh, focus on outcomes, not seat time. We need to recognize the virtual learning, you know, point of the day. <laughs> There's different ways people learn. Uh, and wildly different ways, and that's got to be part of our education structure is to accommodate that. And you know, the, for all public <coughs> employees uh, and all employees generally, we've had some movement from the way we finance health care and benefits that we need to continue. It's a challenge, but continue the movement towards a, a way of paying for those benefits that brings us up to the, the modern day. Um, I think a balanced approach, you know, means 
it's not an either or. It's not, you know, we're going to cut our way to education investment. We're going to uh, find different sources of revenue. We're going to rearrange money that we're already spending. I think we need to look at the complex of, of all of that together. And, and that's you know, ways of doing that are what this document is, is in part about. Um, we did start with a clean sheet. Uh, I remember, you know, Kathy and I, we talked to David Hecker. It was encouraging to say, as we talk about what do we need to fix or tweak in Proposal A, the answer will be found as we look at what is the education system we need and how do we deliver it. And so we, uh, and then we need to decide what resources are sufficient to deliver the outcomes and the education system that we, that we need to have in Michigan to succeed economically and for our people. And certainly on page three here is, is a summary that uh, that education system that we believe uh, potentially as a board is essential. Uh, and coupled with the kinds of reforms, if we're going to provide that kind of support uh, that need to go along with that education system. Uh, again, we're saying that a continuum uh, that includes, we should as a state provide universal access to early childhood programming. We should provide kindergarten and require it for all students. We should provide K-12 support that at least is a sufficient level to provide education services without wildly expanding class sizes, without laying off quality teachers. We need to provide a sufficient financial support for the K-12 system. One big undone piece of Proposal A was we didn't pay for infrastructure, which now includes virtual, the buildings, the equipment, <coughs> the labs, and you know, we, so how do we have a system that, and so we have wildly different school infrastructure depending on where you live in the state. Uh, and some states and some communities cannot afford at all to raise money if they're poor and their SEVs are low to, to have a, a adequate infrastructure. So we need a system that provides a baseline of infrastructure support. Uh, one of the, the things that we did come to some agreement on a couple years ago in what in one of my colleagues reminded me it would be good to call the Lieutenant Governor's Commission on Higher Education Economic Growth, not necessarily the Cherry Commission, though that is how it's known, which was a good bipartisan effort. So. We'll call it the Murray Commission after Mark Murray, who was yeah. central to that. Um, but th that group agreed, look, we need to set a higher benchmark for education attainment for all our citizens, and it should at least be <coughs> two years of post-secondary technical or apprenticeship education to help equip people with what they need to succeed today. High school is not the end. A higher level of education attainment is the end. So we need a system that basically provides that, that supports it, just as we've had a system over the years that said, we pay, we support, we invest in K-12 education for all. Now we need a system that says we invest in up to two years of post-secondary for all. Uh, and we need a, to value and not uh, destroy the higher education institutions, which are the envy of the nation, which have had uh, uh, no, so, you know, declining support relative to states even that are going through the same fiscal condition we are because there's such engines of economic growth, of education, but also of new knowledge, new creation, new business, new industries. And uh, these pieces of the puzzle are what we talked about um, needing to put in place. Now we're also saying if we're going to provide that kind of support, we have to have clear expectations of what the results are. And one of the major expectations is our basic expectation, do what you want in education, K-12, but we <coughs> expect progress adequate pro progress every year with no remediation and we expect you to graduate students without remediation. And that should be the goal. Teach however you want, meet our standards, but that's the goal and that's the expectation. On page um, four, we talked through two, some of these innovations that are uh, important to delivering this quality education. No remediation system, one of the ideas that germinated as part of our group discussion was that uh, we should be potentially encouraging a refashioning of the K-12 financing to have a uh, school-based, if you're a school, you get a foundation grant. Uh, that would also be helpful if it was adjusted periodically to deal with declining enrollments or accelerating enrollments, but there's a sort of a base support that you need as a school. There would be a per-pupil grant that would uh, be very flexible, used for education, however you see to deliver it, including the infrastructure, virtual and real, and that the combination in some, you know, some recipe would be how we fund schools to provide uh, the incentives for success, but also the basic foundation support that schools need. We also were pr prospectively saying, you know, as part of this, <coughs> we, every child should have an opportunity without penalty and the system needs to be able to support and create incentive for early college credit taking, dual enrollment, uh, the kind of uh, a great uh, progression of experiences that are 
not only uh, essential, they're, they're very effective even for the poorest kids, the most at-risk kids, to have take that AP course, take that dual enrollment. That's got to be part of the system. As we're arguing in the system, we need to better undergird our higher ed uh, opportunity for people and our support system. Uh, in exchange for that, uh, we need our higher ed institutions to restrain tuition, to be part of a, a lifelong data system that allows us to track students, to be better willing to accept credits, transfers from community college, dual enrollment. Um, we have moved in the state from a system where 70% uh, of our higher ed expenditures were paid for by the state by generalized revenues to, and 30% for tuition. We are now at 70% of tuition is paying for that education and 30% from the state. That, that means a big change. And we also, the combination of state funding is not supporting our higher ed system, community colleges and universities, anywhere near. In fact, we're 50 out of 50 states in our support for higher ed. Uh, relative to states, you know, that are also going through financial um, cuts, hurts. They're just making more of a priority of supporting higher education and higher education opportunity. States like North Carolina that are like us, states like Indiana, you know, manufacturing states. Uh, so we also want to sync up our budget and school cycles uh, so that we're not getting into this uh, crazy game and proration uh, situation, and that should be a requirement. All right. How do we pay for this system uh, that, we, that we need? Um, one point is that we've got to get past this sort of either or, that uh, there's one way to do it. Uh, there is a combination of, of rearranging dollars, uh, spending uh, less and saving money in things that are less related to the outcomes that we want, and uh, if necessary, you know, having the will to get uh, revenues or to rearrange our revenue structure so it's more predictable. And I would just emphasize uh, and in this document, you say, if we're serious in delivering that system that we just put up in front of you, uh, it would mean rearranging $3 billion. And I emphasize rearrange. Uh, you know, as an example, our, our parents and, you know, I'm paying for, for a University of Michigan education for my daughter right now, which has gone up significantly in price. It's still a bargain relative to, you know, Harvard and McAllister, but uh, if, if we as a state do better in financing uh, higher education tuition, uh, taxpayers and parents are going to put a lot more money in their pocket. And we want to look exactly at what the ways are we can do that. Um, we also have to, I mean, we're just nicking around at this in the legislature and right now in terms of doing this combination of things at the scale we need to make uh, the kind of support for people and education that we as a state must have. Uh, so we've got to be willing to uh, move this forward in a way that is much more uh, serious, aggressive, and comprehensive. Uh, and, and at the scale that we can realize some of these benefits we talked about of higher education. So we're recommending this for balanced, comprehensive, long-term approach that needs to be the text for what the state works on and seriously works on and comes together on in a bipartisan way uh, if we're going to deliver uh, the, the system that can work. So, all right, on page um, seven is the sum of, if we laid out the system that I just summarized, uh, what would it cost? Uh, I do this, you know, at some risk because this is, this is a lot of money being rearranged and I emphasize rearranged, it's a lot of money. <coughs> but uh, with the help of digesting all the analysis and credible uh, estimates that are out there, uh, if we wanted to deliver universal pre-K, uh, depending on the target of how many, all eligible or, or 80 percent or more, it would be 150 to 300 million dollars. If we want to actually mandate kindergarten, it wouldn't cost much more because most of our kids are in kindergarten. Uh, if we want to keep as sort of a proxy for what's the a decent level of education, pre-cuts of the last year, if we provided that support, that kind of foundation level support for all our school districts, that would be more than enough or adequate money to deliver education in this sort of argument. But we need to uh, find and rearrange $850 uh, or to a billion dollars to do that. Um, if we over time, and you know, this number is a large number, but if we move to what um, Dave Olmsted and Doug Roberts Sr. Uh, recommended a few years ago, that the cost of every, ed of every child's education includes some infrastructure, the buildings, the equipment, the virtual infrastructure, that that's uh, approximately 10 percent of, uh, of their educational cost total. If we move to that over time and got away from the system, it would be, you know, a billion dollars 
that we need to put in there. We would ultimately save a billion dollars from the local millages and other things that are building, you know, school buildings as we speak. To realize this basic goal, which is, again, one of the better fruits of the collective work we've done in this state to say our education expectations have got to be pitched at a higher level today in the economy and the world we're in. That's at least, you know, some post-secondary education for everyone. Uh, to provide that for graduating uh, seniors from high school, to allow them to finance higher education a la uh, the Michigan Promise. It could be done in a very different way than the Michigan Promise. You know, it could be need-based. It could be uh, someone's, you know, some governor <coughs> candidate's own name and recipe. But to bring back that kind of commitment of $150 million uh, is part of that puzzle. And then we've got hundreds of workers out there who've been laid off and lost their job. They need a post-secondary technical degree certificate to participate and to create in this economy. And there are thousands of workers who have put up their hands for no worker left behind, which said, we'll help pay for two years of post-secondary community college degree to help you become a medical technician and move from uh, being a laid off, you know, Delphi or Visteon employee where there are job opportunities. If we actually wanted to do what we need to do for those thousands of people, it's another $200 million that we need to find. Uh, and th those two things together would deliver this goal as a state, which is one of the better things we've done, of saying we're going to help everybody reach a post-secondary degree or credential. Uh, and finally, if we were to move back to at least a 50-50 tuition versus state aid for how we pay for college for people, which would also put us right back into the middle of peer states in terms of our basic support for our higher education institutions, that's another a $950 million uh, budget priority that we would need to make. So that is the education system in broad strokes that makes us competitive, makes us succeed, provides, grows our economy, <coughs> and is important uh, and should be on the table in terms of what we do to make our state thrive. Now, how do we pay for this? And as I said, in, in a combination of approaches, we can rearrange dollars to pay for that system if we're serious and if we have leadership that helps us get it done. Uh, these are, I think, some very helpful improved digestion on page eight and nine of where the money could be found to uh, support this kind of comprehensive education system. We could find about $300 million through shared services slash consolidation in a number of different ways. And I want to, you know, it helps to, to look at these hard as well as all the other ideas hard. Um, one, you know, there could be prescription that uh, and or incentives to consolidate services uh, in a variety of ways that could be prescribed. B, we could basically also prescribe that the ISDs, uh, the really darken the dotted lines with the ISDs and say, you know, a lot of things are going to shift to the ISDs and you're going to face say 5% of the cost on everything that's shifted, and we could prescribe that. Or, as some have proposed, there could be a um, base closing style legislative commission that, that empowered a group to make decisions that the legislature would endorse on, we think we can save cost savings this way through these consolidations that will seriously save money. That's another tactic. The bottom line is all of those tactics could get you probably $300 million over time each year. I mean, all these are annual numbers. Uh, if we moved, again, with new hires or more ambitiously with more of our public employees and teachers to a defined contribution system, it costs money up front to do that, uh, $250 million in year one if everybody moved, as I understand, and I welcome help when uh, we get into <coughs> questions on all of these pieces, uh, but ultimately you're saving $200 million a year. Uh, this system of no remediation, which again, Liz and others uh, helped us fashion where we're basically saying part of the outcomes for this level of support is no remediation year to year and graduation. It means, you know, you call, community colleges can bill back to the K-12s uh, if uh, you don't uh, graduate with the skills needed. Uh, we think this combination of, of no remediation will save higher education institutions and ourselves, you know, some range of money. This is more speculative, but there's some millions there in, in reduced remediation costs. The com some way of uh, changing our health benefit structure uh, obviously is a serious uh, way money can be saved on that front uh, that could be plowed into other areas, uh, $500 million being in the mid-range of all these ranges depending on how you do it, but there's a serious uh, 
issue there. Over time, again, if we went to state financing school infrastructure, then uh, we are going to save over time uh, local infrastructure uh, costs. Again, that's a long term. It wouldn't be one billion in any one year, but it's you know it's a serious move, and it's one that is worthy of us uh, seeing if we can contemplate and package into our system. Um, the again, what I just indicated, if we're financing higher ed or changing the mix of how we finance higher ed so that the tuition costs aren't skyrocketing and the state raised revenues are supporting that. Taxpayers and families get $700 million back of the $900 million that it would take to, to do that uh, every, in a year. Uh, the issue that we talked about too, there's, it's really hard to get a number on. There's a, a thoughtful a recommendation on how the contract double dipping retirees who come back as consultants in education and contract employees could be treated, which uh, it could be one small contribution how much that adds up to, we don't really know. This is a pretty broad range. Um, it's being discussed, it's been recommended by uh, our friends at MEA and many others that there's some way to either create a guarantee that the fund equity is not needed, but the state's going to be predictable or change the payment schedule or that you don't need to keep as much money and, uh, and you shouldn't. There's some way of treating that that's on the table that could save some money. So th these are somewhat apples and oranges, but they do add up to a significant array of meaningful savings. You know, there are other ideas that we discussed that nobody liked that aren't on this list, and you know, everyone has you know, questions, <coughs> issues with several of these, but there's a complex of ways to save money. There also is a complex of ways, uh, and this is table uh, D on page 10, that are meaningful in terms of the way if new revenues are needed and, and or as revenue changes that help us make this system predictable. You know, the, the main way to make it more predictable is <coughs> one that I certainly view as, as incredibly important and logical personally, which is to basically extend the taxes we have and lower the rate doing so to what the economy is today. Uh, and you raise considerable amounts of money even with a lowered rate, depending on how you do that. Uh, a graduate income tax, which you know, could be arguably fairer. Uh, you raise resources. All of these things called taxes are politically so difficult but they're, uh, you know, they're important uh, pieces of the puzzle. Uh, some, like this idea that we recommended, uh, we've heard calls for local millages going back to ability to raise more resources locally. I think none of us want to go back to the good old bad old days of Proposal A when you had these vast inequities or pre-Proposal A, but if there's some way to allow that to happen, a la the countywide millage we have, where basically if you do that, resources have to be shared with the whole state or with some pieces of the state that maybe need more help. That would be an interesting and perhaps supportable proposition. Uh, you could raise more money there. Many, several of you don't like as much as I this uh, sort of a tax on the senior population. Uh, I think as a state, we are the only state, one of perhaps a handful of states that just doesn't tax, is very generous in terms of private pension not being taxed. And my personal argument would be um, our future as a state is not to be a, a retirement community. It's to be a place that is a thriving uh, place where lots of people, young and old, want to be. And if we're basically not foregoing uh, resources by not taxing uh, folks who can't afford it at the, who are older, that we need to ha send people to college here and to pay for K-12 education, we're basically destroying our ability to be a place that, uh, that thrives, that supports education, higher education that young people would want to be. So, but that's my uh, little soapbox on that um, and why I left it on the list because several of you, ah, I don't want to tax the old people. Um, so eliminating targeted tax credits, you know, there, there is always debate about which of the tax credits from what Patrick Anderson laid out in his study to other studies, which of these aren't contributing much. Uh, I think there has <coughs> got to be a thoughtful way we as a state could pick off a number of these. You remember Charlie Ballard waving his big book around. In here is some stuff that probably isn't doing a lot as much good. And you have Patrick Anderson's study, which names some of the big ticket items like mega and other things that may or may not contribute to the economy. Then you have another study that comes out saying, oh, no, they really do. But there's some money there that we could agree and with some leadership agreed to save money. So you put those pieces of the puzzle together, you're looking at some serious ways to rearrange the money towards the ultimate system that we have. So the recommendations that are made in here or that are described in here that we could make, um, which certainly I hope we come to a way forward on, are first, number one, how could we endorse these principles 
perhaps the key elements of the needed education system for Michigan, and if we're willing to endorse, uh, you know, there's a package of cost savings and revenue elements that <laughs> together can get us where we need to go. Uh, that would be, uh, I think, a very important contribution for us to make that, and then two, you know, this is not going to happen overnight. This requires serious, continued, real leadership, uh, and we can ask Mike to uh, continue this real coming together process with the key education stakeholders, the legislature and the governor over this year. I think we're not expecting, I'm not expecting in this very polarized partisan election year that we're going to get a lot more than posturing or, you know, a limited fiscal train wreck solution to this. I'm hoping we can. But we need to set the table and engage people seriously on are you, are you willing to come together with this more comprehensive solution. And if we as a bipartisan board call for that, task our state superintendent, uh, who I think is uniquely positioned to help lead that discussion, uh, and if we're serious about it, then I think we can make some more headway in this. Um, and you know, our job is to kind of step above the fray, and to, we are elected for eight-year terms, uh, we're a functional bipartisan group. In the Constitution, I think it says our job is to make recommendations for how we finance and support education. I think it's important that we do that. So those are two recommendations I hope we can come to um, consensus on if possible. Finally, we still got this year, and it's a mess. And this is really tough for anybody, including ourselves. You know, what's the recipe? There is an attachment that basically describes uh, if we choose to. Here's a way we could say something perhaps constructive about what we need to do right now. And it's sort of just this arbitrary 50-50 uh, approach that if we want to keep K-12 funding back at some level, three cuts, then we need to find half the money through uh, cost cutting and half the money through some combination of new revenues, a la what we've you know, are, are embedded as some of the elements in here. If we're willing, if we want to fund pre-K, you know, we could do it similarly. You got to find K-12 operators, uh, cost savings equal to half the amount, and we as a state will figure out how to raise some money to put you in there. It's, it's expensive, but if we were serious about returning our state to where it needs to be around higher education support, again, it would have this target of, let's get back to 50-50 tuition and state aid. Uh, and we've got to find the money, in my view, I mean, that's my personal view, but we got to rearrange the money to do that. I think we are killing ourselves as a state uh, uh, by not uh, leveraging one of the greatest assets we have, which is we got the greatest learning institutions on earth in this state. I'm not just saying that, you know, because I'm in Michigan. Our university system is unrivaled. Our community college system is fantastic. Uh, we're killing it, and it's unconscionable, and it's doing a disservice to our economic future. So I'll just end with these little picture grams that I borrowed from some of my national work uh, that kind of illustrate the case. The, the states that are richest, these are the richest states today. You know, there's 12 or 13 of them. It's Colorado, which has massive in, in migration of well-educated people. It's Minnesota. Uh, it ain't us anymore. Uh, those are the richest states. Uh, this is uh, the states with the highest education attainment. Uh, it's Lou's point, Lou Glazer, who summarized at the beginning of the document. Basically, the states that are the richest today, with a few exceptions, those are Wyoming, um, Nevada, and Florida. Those are the three states that aren't among the highest educated. And you know, Wyoming's a mineral boom, you know, oil boom. Nevada is Nevada, whatever they do out there. You know, it's Las Vegas, and Florida, you know, is Florida. So, but look at the rest of them, and it's uh, these are the places where they're making money and they're growing jobs, and uh, we're not there. So. Thank you for your, the opportunity to try to facilitate this piece together. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, Thank you very Excellent. much, John. That's effort. very helpful. Get us going on a good discussion. Well, why don't I try to um, <coughs> facilitate for the discussion. John, thank you. That was just excellent. And as I said earlier, I, I think this is maybe the single best effort done in years by any group uh, to try to remedy our long-term and even short-term problems. So I admire your leadership on this. I, I just wanted to say, yesterday I was on my way to give a talk at the Rotary Club in Birmingham, listening to the radio, and they were announcing that there was going to be a discussion of water supply and water problems and solutions by John Austin. Uh, unfortunately, I had to get out of the car and go to what I was doing, <laughs> but he's an expert on a lot of different things. So, but I told Kathy, the, I mean, the bottom line is what's important to our economy, and so you know that's part of why I'm privileged to serve with you all. Comes from there.
One thing I did notice, by the way, is once you pull out of the governor's race, your name goes off everything. That was the one thing I heard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Cherry. Excuse me. That, um, that was meant to be funny, and it actually probably didn't come off quite that way. So, so, Sandra, uh, well, thank, thank you, John, for putting this together. Um, I know that this, there's a lot of work that went into this, and, and you took all of our uh, comments and questions to heart. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think that, you know, just to make a kind of a brief statement, I, we need to be respectful of the fact that people are suffering in the state. And there's a lot of anger out there and, and hostility. And, you know, certainly respect that and at the same time recognize that our state is at a crossroads. And we need to decide what kind of state we want to live in. <coughs> Do we want to live in the bottom ten or the top ten or somewhere in the middle? Um, I don't think that we can underplay in any way the economic benefits of what we're talking about here. The fact that uh, investments in these things are not just about taxes and spending, it's about um, job creation and an educated society and bringing companies to Michigan. Um, there are long-term savings to be realized. And, you know, just looking at a couple of the early childhood education, the fact that, you know, you save so much money down the road in crime and crime prevention and remediation and drug and alcohol abuse and all these societal issues that we have. And then with the higher education, I don't think, I think you did a very good job, John, of, of talking about the benefits of investing in higher education. But, you know, we can't say it enough, the fact that we have one of the best higher education systems in this country. And we have three research universities that are creating jobs every single day. You know, spin-offs. Look at Tech Town. Went from four companies eight years ago to 140 today. Yeah. The, that's thanks to higher education. So um, while I know there's going to be people who are going to look at this and say, here we go again, you know, we can't afford this, I would say we can't afford not to do it. Thank you. Other board members. Boy. Nancy, is I'll that give it a, I'll yeah. give it a <coughs> shot here. <laughs> um, I think I think one of the things we in Michigan have not done that we need to do, and this is going to kind of go along with what Cassandra and John have just said, we cannot look at what where we want to be without looking at how we're going to get there. We also can't look at how we're going to get there with looking at the low-lying fruit and saying that's good enough. I think that this will not be something that will, um, well, I won't even say I think, I know. We all know it won't be easy because if it were, we would have done it already. Uh, I think that what has to happen in my mind is that we need to make some of the very, very difficult, um, tough decisions about rearranging what we currently have before we talk about adding any new kind of um, taxes, any new kind of revenue. <coughs> we always go to that first, and then what happens is rearranging never takes place because, oh, well, we'll just get more taxes. So I think it's going to be a time where we have to really sit down and seriously say, everything is out, everything is off the table. Now what are we going to put back and how are we going to put it back so that we can create a system that will potentially get us there and then see where we stand with our revenue. But we have to make that commitment first to rearranging before we ever talk about revenue. Um, new revenue. Otherwise, that rearranging will never take place. And that's something I'm very, very concerned about. Um, so I hope that we have the um, internal fortitude and the uh, invisible shield around ourselves that will deflect all bullets <laughs> so that we can make those decisions and we can talk seriously about what needs to change in the way we are doing business. Otherwise, we'll be tinkering again. And I don't want to see that happen. We have such a good possibility with this document, with everything that we've done, with where we stand on those maps. We can't ignore reality. 
somebody said to me, but you know what? When I said to them, you know, you know, Louisiana and and some of these other states are doing tremendous things. Yeah, but that's Louisiana. No, no, wait. No, Louisiana is now able to look at and say, yeah, but that's Michigan. Because we have dropped so far in our standing in so many ways. We are not who we once were. And we need to go back there. But we can't go back there by tinkering. We have to be wholesale draconian. So I'm encouraging my fellow board members and those here in education to... Uh, take up the battle cry and and uh, be bold in what we do. So that's my thought on it. Catherine. Well, well <coughs> I, I think it's very, it's very good that as John laid it out that, that we look at education from early childhood through higher education. I think that's a contribution that we can make because it has it hasn't been looked at that way. It right. should have been, but it hasn't been. And I think that, you know, if you read the Constitution, it says that the State Board of Education is everything from uh, K-12 to through higher education and adult education uh, and community colleges, a few other things. That, uh, <clears throat> so I think we're, if we do this, which I think we, we have to, uh, we'll be fulfilling our constitutional responsibility. So that, and I think what, what Cassandra said, that it has to be looked at as the best investment the state can make. Absolutely, bar none, <coughs> this is the way to rebuild the state, to restore the economy, to grow the economy, however you want to put it. Uh, it's absolutely essential. And we need, it, the studies have all shown, and we've, we've had the presentations, that we need an educated populace, an educated population in order to have a successful economy. We can't go back to what it was. It's not going to happen that way. So I think what, what, uh, what Nancy is saying is we have said before that we recognize that we have to make ref there have to be reforms in the delivery of the services. And we have to recognize that. We have to work on that. That's absolutely true. But it's also true that every one of the people that spoke to us, uh, from educators to business to the, to the unions to uh, community people, everybody, the economists right, left, and, and center, all said that we need a combination of reform and, if you want to call it restructure, but better ways, more efficient ways of delivering the services, but it's also <coughs> going to take additional revenue. And so we need a combination of the two. And I think we've all said that we have to do, we have to do the reforms, but we're not going to be able to get the other. We won't be able to sell it. But I think it should be recognized that it's, it's in the cards that we're going to need it. And, uh, but I think we have to convince our own constituents, if you will, that we need to reform the way we deliver the services. We have to have more cooperation. We have to have more shared services. It could be shared services not only among school districts, but between school districts and the local units of government where they are located. And there could be all kinds of ways to make things more efficient, <coughs> to save money, but and do it better. Not just to save money, but to make it better. Uh, <coughs> we've talked about having services in the school buildings, we should really promote that kind of idea. We don't have to have separate services, separate buildings for every, every department of government. A lot of them could be in a school building and keep the building open and keep it as part of the neighborhood. So that with schools being closed throughout the state, maybe they don't have to be. Maybe they could be the centers of government for everybody, not just for schools. So I mean, there are all kinds of ways of looking at things in a, in a new way. And uh, I think we have to do that. That's absolutely essential. So. I think we have to go through these things. We have to go through these things one by one and see. Yes, we do agree with this, so you know we want to make this a little different. But we have to, we have to start doing that and not just talk about it. Liz, please. <coughs> yeah, just to keying off of what uh, Kathy just said and, and actually Nancy as well. 
One of the things that has always frustrated me is that when systems redesign themselves, they look at what they've got and move it around rather than looking at who uses the service and what do they need. And I think if we have this incredible opportunity right now in this time span, particularly in the next um, eight months, uh, because we're going to be having a new administration in this state. We're going to be having uh, a lot of new legislators. It's an opportunity through the uh, election process to educate people who will be making decisions that come January 2011 uh, to these issues, and we may be able to have fresh looks at things. But what, like Kathy was saying, you know, the person, the human <coughs> being that uses our public schools also uses other services. Mm -hmm. And right now, uh, for the most needy people, we have made it the most difficult task. Um, if you've got money and a car and power and policy, you can manipulate those five different agencies of state government and get what your kid needs. But if you don't, you're really, you're really hand strung. And the, the uh, collaborative uh, services in the, in the local neighborhood school building makes uh, it accessible, <laughs> available, affordable to people. And if we thought about the money in the budgets of human services, corrections, has educational institutions, community health, social services, um, education, and Department of Labor and Economic Growth, if we put all of their budgets in a pot and said, what do the people of Michigan need, I think we could design something that was very cost effective and maybe even return money to the taxpayers. Well, maybe not. But, but the, point, the point is there's a lot of money in the total state budget, not just the Department of Education is trying to do its job. We talk about pre-K to, to post-secondary, <coughs> but adult ed, GED prep aren't even in our domain, our sphere of influence. They're in Department of Labor and Economic Growth. The kids that are in institutions are in our sphere of influence, but they're sort of off the radar, you know, and they don't get the same look. I know this because of the complaints that um, we get for the failure of the educational <coughs> system in those institutional settings. So um, anyway, I just, I'm thinking that we need to look at what we have domain over and, you know, and make recommendations. But I would hope we can engage this bigger discussion for the po policy makers that maybe we need, um, you know, more collapsing. You know, back in the day, it was health, <coughs> education, and welfare was all under one heading. <laughs> not maybe not in this state, but certainly in the federal government. And then they parceled it out. But every time you make a new division or a new uh, <coughs> entity, you create a new administrative structure. And the big bucks are always in the administrative structure. And when the cuts come, it's always at the point of service. And uh, and so. Uh, I think a new new way of thinking would be who are the people we serve and how do we better serve them and design the system to serve them in a way that is accessible, available, affordable, adequate, um, the five A's of good health care. That's with those kinds of things. So I just want us to think, big, you know, all this stuff, but I, let's think a little beyond. Where are some resources that aren't in our in, in our budget, on the line items of education budget, but are in fact related to education. Thank you. Thank you. Reggie, please. <clears throat> um, there were a couple concepts that um, uh, were discussed in uh, in uh, some of our earlier meetings that uh, didn't make it in. And, just wanted to chat about a couple of them. And I, you recommended a good idea that I didn't get in the final penultimate draft here about the competitive bidding, which I apologize for. I wanted to mention it when I talked, but go on. There's many well, more. John, you've done a fine job. I, I, I do appreciate it. And I should have started out by echoing the no. gratitude that, um, that other members of the board expressed for the work that you've done um, over the course of the last few weeks. And, and, and I'm, I'm grateful to all of you for taking on this task and for making a bold statement about what education in the state of Michigan should, uh, should look like. And particularly uh, pleased that we are taking the approach, the, the realistic approach in my humble opinion, um, that, 
there has to be shared sacrifice. Uh, and we have to demonstrate to uh, the people of the state of Michigan that we understand that, that they're hurting and that as we uh, go and ask them for more resources uh, to support a quality educational system, we have to ensure that that system is as efficient and effective as possible. Uh, so um, I see that uh, loud and clear, and I should say I hear it loud and clear in order to avoid mixing my metaphor. Um, I hear it loud and clear uh, in this document. Um, uh, one concept on the on the quality education side that I um, I know we discussed um, was longer school year, more instructional time, and I'm not sure I see that um, here. Um, in which I think we need to think about um, what that should look like and, and what it would cost, and incorporate that into our um, our, uh, our document. Um, and then on the cost saving side, you mentioned the, the, the competitive bidding uh, concept, and, um, and and I know that that uh, uh, some people think that you know that this is it would mandate outsourcing, but I don't I don't believe in in mandating outsourcing just for the sake of outsourcing, but I do think that competitive uh, bidding processes can sharpen everyone's thinking about the best ways to provide non-instructional services um, um, in the most efficient and effective ways uh, to, again, put, put more money into the classroom um, and take it out of the administrative uh, bureaucracy that we see in many places. So along with consolidation, because again, consolidation, just for consolidation's sake, doesn't necessarily save any money unless you do it efficiently. Um, just making something <coughs> bigger doesn't necessarily make it more efficient. Um, uh, these things have to be done carefully with thought, um, and again, bringing the best ideas uh, to the table from both the public sector and the private sector to ensure that we are, are, are as efficient and effective as we possibly can be. Can, can I just respond to a couple of these points? Just um, and ultimately, we need to talk about where we can go with this. Uh, I think there are um, a number of additional sort of major pieces of the puzzle that we need to decide: you know, Do we want to get into our basic set of ideas, um, and/or do we want to make sure if we sort of challenge Mike to continue this process that they get into it? But you know, to your points, Liz, um, you know, some of what we looked at and laid out here include, you know, if we're serious about adults getting a post-secondary degree, it is asking DLEG, what would it take, you know, to do deliver the goods for no worker left behind. But if there is other silo busting, and you had some nascent sort of silo integration or silo busting, oh, yeah. I mean, I hope we as a state and we as a board, what, what is the big specific thing, you know, that we might want to see make the list of major structural changes? that we think are important. That's what I want to see. Well, I, I have, I I have some that several. didn't get in the thing. Right. And so, They're more but, controversial. <laughs> and so we need to figure out how to continue to iterate, you know, yeah. a set of ideas that we yeah. think are major pieces, not everything. And the longer school year, Reggie, after we talked about it and looked at it yeah. and hearing back from people, it, it didn't make it in here in part because if we just think of it, and, but we may want to reassert it in here, if we just extend the school year or demand X, you know, for X days, it's a it's another big ticket financial item relative to other things. However, another way to think about it is if we are serious about moving to this, we don't care how you deliver education, we care about the outcomes. It, you know, no remediation, graduation, mm -hmm. uh, deliver deliver it however you want. It frees everybody to say you can teach it for six months, you can teach them all year. Uh, you to figure out how they achieve um, the outcome which is a more, you know, radical, ambitious way to interpret what we might do, but it, it is a way we could try to lead the discussion. Or we could just say, no, you know, God, excuse my friend, we need 180s or days or we can't have 150, you know, we need 190. Um, we, need, we need to probably speak to that. Well, I, I, um, I, I do understand, uh, John, the point that um, what we're most concerned about is outcomes and um, the means to get there is um, um, is not as important as the as the outcome, but um, I do think that we we need to look at best practices around the world and emulate um, some of the systems that um, um, that seem to be producing um, better quality instruction. And I think the trend is toward um, lengthening uh, the amount of instructional time 
in in those um, nations that are that are moving fastest into 21st century uh, quality education. And uh, you know, I'm I, I don't have a particular prescription or number of days in mind right at this time, but I but I do think that you know as we ask the legislature um, to look um, at ways to uh, improve the quality of instruction in Michigan, that should be on the table um, because it appears to be from the research that I think we've we've seen and talked about at this table, it uh, seems to be the best practice um, to um, include more instructional time, not necessarily seat time, <coughs> right, because we're talking about a variety of different ways of delivering the content, um, but we need to, we need to um, have our students spending um, more time in the learning process. Thank you. Liz, and then I Carolyn, please. Just quickly tag on Reggie's. If you take that chart with the 10 <coughs> most uh, highest economic things and the 10 states with the, and put their school years on top of it, you will also notice that most of them have at least a month more in class time. Massachusetts, Colorado, you know. Carolyn, and then Mary Ann. goes to show you. Um, <coughs> thank you, John, for what you've done on this and for all of my colleagues with their suggestions. I just want to go <coughs> on record as saying I really think we need mandatory kindergarten. Yes. It blows my mind that we don't have. And I know that many states have the four-year-old preschool program. And I think we, you know, every study we've done, everything we've <coughs> talked about, that keeps getting said over and over and over, but we're not there. And I think somehow we need to make it happen. <coughs> Thank you, yeah. Mary Ann. Please. Um, I think you've all said wonderful things here, and um, I, I think what's kind of coming through is that um, we are looking at long-term solutions and short-term solutions and um, I wasn't happy with the short-term solution that was offered here. No uh, reflection on you, John. <laughs> um, but I, this tax on services is not a new discussion and um, we know the districts are hurting. We know something needs to be done immediately. <coughs> um, from my standpoint, I think uh, a tax on services, I would favor leaving the 6% sales tax because businesses will always charge 6 cents anyway. If it's 5.5, .5, they're still going to charge 6 cents. So I would say leave the 6% um, the sales tax and um, uh, extend the service tax to all services, including attorneys. No including what? <laughs> attorneys. <laughs> We're going to tax our pension. And, um, and then uh, along with that, uh, getting back to what Nancy suggested, work on the rearranging, if we want to call it that, or uh, reduction, or I think that can be worked on with, with the uh, tax and services, because it's, it's going to take a while for that to kick in, even if we did pass it this year. Um, but I think I think we're looking at um, some really really wonderful uh, suggestions here that could um, really work to uh, lift our state up as as we're uh, discussing here. We've we've got the talent, uh, and and part of the problem, of course, will be to keep that talent in the state. <coughs> So I, one of my suggestions I did not see in here was lowering class sizes. I think, I think that to talk about any level of education without uh, <coughs> uh, uh, under 30 in a classroom is, uh, 
not going to get us any place. So that's what I have to do. Thank you, Marianne. Other board members, Nance, please. I think, um, thank you, uh, Marianne, for providing <laughs> the perfect segue. <laughs> I what? think it, <laughs> as we start looking at um, redefining how education is delivered, Marianne has brought up two very key issues that <coughs> he's absolutely right. In the current way we do education, oh, having thanks. 30 children in a classroom <laughs> is, un is, is untenable. But if we rearrange and re restructure how we deliver education, those 30 kids that are in a classroom wouldn't have to be in the classroom all at once at the same time. They wouldn't have to be sitting anywhere, actually. They, well, they're going to be sitting somewhere, but they wouldn't have to be in a building. They could be in a variety of activities over a variety of t lengths of time in a variety of imparters of education mm -hmm. so that your per pupil in the classroom is only, um, is, it, it's only valid if you continue to look at the Carnegie unit. And I would be determined to not continue looking at the Carnegie unit. And so it seems to me that we need that is one of the, the lead ways that we can start restructuring, reorganizing, <laughs> rethinking how we impart education to those that need that. Mm -hmm. And at the first get-go, it seems to me those that need that are my age. So it seems to me that we need to to rethink how we deliver what it is we know children need to know and be able to do and we may take care of in many cases class sizes by doing <coughs> that. Um, I also think that it's important as, as uh, Kathy said when you think back to what the school was in our in our parents time our school and, and largely <coughs> many of our, in our early childhood too, the school was the center of the community. The building was the place everyone gathered to be community. If we cannot come back to that notion in whatever way that means, virtually or in reality, we have lost the sense, the very powerful sense of public and free education in this country. Education is not just the four, <coughs> uh, the, the basic four, reading, writing, arithmetic that we used to call it. Education goes well beyond that to leadership and life skills and community involvement and citizenship and all of those things that we know affect the economy. <coughs> and if we cannot bring those services to bear, you know, you <coughs> talked about, you talked about, um, Carolyn, uh, preschool and, and early childhood. If you think about all of the programs we have in this state, in this country, that are aimed at early childhood, that have nothing to do with any department of education, I mean, how foolish. If, in fact, we believe, as we've said we all have, that early childhood determines whether, in large part, whether a child will be successful in school or not. Why wouldn't it be involved with the Department of Education? Why wouldn't there be a collaborative effort? It just, it seems to me a no-brainer. But we have so siloed ourselves that, oh, nope, nope, can't go over there, that's the line. Nope, can't do that. Nope, can't go over here, that's the line. It's time that we start putting the, the either literal or figurative school building back in the center of our community and asking what are the whole needs of the whole child and how can we work together to bring that to bear to the success of not only our children but our current community as well. I think it's <coughs> so. Can I ask a process question maybe with the chair hat for a minute? Um, and there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just posing questions with this kind of a business meeting format today. There could possibly be an amendment for some possible action this afternoon if the board chose. Um, there could be uh, 
uh, more discussion now, obviously. There could be um, our next meeting is a more open-ended meeting. There could be a little bit today and more of that time. I'm just wondering what John did in particular. Make a, what a recommendation. I think, and we discussed, you know, Kathy and I and others, uh, we probably would not get um, perfect agreement on this whole family of language recommendations and direction today. But um, possibilities, from my view, include there are there are probably some language suggestions people would like to make in this general set of ideas. There are probably some adornments to some of the particular recommendations that we need to process. Um, I think there are then you know several sort of potential layers of <coughs> how far we want to go, um, and and I guess I would probably suggest we do need to uh, take some time to process all of these iterations and maybe we do something today that is, you know, receive the report and if we want to endorse its general contours while figuring out very quickly how we come to grips with some of the uh, ch changes we might need to fully, you know, uh, endorse every word of a report. But I, get, I think the major issues then become uh, can we and are we coming to some agreement on a set of principles that guide us on a set of, on a description of the education system that we want to see be the system which I think we're very close on. And then there are two ways that I could see us rec making recommendations around uh, how we pay for it and how we, uh, you know, what, what combination of reforms, revenue changes, cuts. The strongest would be is that we do, as Kathy suggested, we really go over the list, add some things to the list, as you all did, that weren't on it, and, and have a list that say this is the package that we really think is the way we should finance the system that we just bless. The, the, if we can't get agreement totally on that because, you know, eight people, someone may totally hold out against, you know, the progressive income tax or the old person's tax or the defined contribution. <laughs> you so, just, you've killed it already. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the, so the way to kill it. <laughs> right. The strongest, the, the, weaker, the weaker set of recommendations is we think we're showing, based on everything that's out there, a way forward. These all need to be on the table and, you know, this is sort of the family of things. This is the menu, which is a weaker statement. We can agree. We think the right way to finance the system is this combination of things. That would be stronger. Uh, so I think either is a contribution because we're basically saying we need this and here's the way you can really pay for it. Um, and then the, the last piece is do we want to say anything about the short term right now? Uh, about we got to find some solution that rearranges some money to keep you know, the foundation grant and to undergird either early childhood or, or edu higher education this year while putting this set of ideas together that we really ask Mike and our leaders to help us move <coughs> forward and help us process more, you know, more fully. Nancy and then Rob and then Carolyn. I, I guess my, my recommendation, and first of all, let me apologize for my, my, uh, my peer here, John, who's usually so adept at, and adroit at wordsmithing, who um, we really do need to sit down and talk about old people's taxes. But, um, <laughs> 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 um, at any rate, I, I guess my recommendation would be that, that uh, we acknowledge and uh, support this very worthwhile um, tack that we've gone on and that it's worth going on to put legs under it. Uh, but uh, for a very selfish reason, I guess I will say I would not want to have a vote on anything this afternoon because I'd like to be a part of that and I'm unfortunately not able to be here this afternoon. Um, but also for the reason that, that you said that I think it's important that we as close as we can encompass the, the collaborative feelings of the whole not of individuals. Um, so uh, I don't think we're going to get there yet before 12, so um, that would be my recommendation. <coughs> Robin and Carolyn, and then Nance, uh, I'm sorry, and then Kat. I had a couple of things, actually. Um, You're only allowed one, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Cut me off already. Kidding. <laughs> um, Marianne had actually raised a great point as far as the class size, and I wanted to just remind everybody that you do have that referenced on page three here. You just need to insert the word 
and smaller class sizes? And I, I wanted to similarly note, if, if we were serious about what we're recommending here, it provides, I think, the support to allow class sizes not to be what they need to be and to get away from Carnegie units and other things. Too. Exactly. But I also wanted to just applaud the effort of the board. Honestly, this is uh, the vision, tremendous. As far as Mike's question, as far as short term, it's, this is an immediate crisis, and I'm here to remind everybody of the immediacy of the crisis. Um, I got the closing. email just right. this morning from our superintendent after our uh, board meeting last night, and our state board, our local state board, has looked at every conceivable cut that has put, been put on the table, and if we put all of them, every projected cut on the table, we're nowhere near close to our shortfall. This is after closing two buildings and restructuring the entire district. Mm -hmm. And that is, it, it's somewhat uh, shocking when you see how, how it, the, just the magnitude of the problem. And with every conceivable, you know, eliminating busing, gone. Um, there's so many different facets of this that were unexpected, of course, but with the recent cut this year and the projected uh, problems next year, this really needs to be looked at closely immediately. And of course, the superintendent can do nothing but saying, say, to appeal to your legislators, we've got to be able to have them address this. And so your leadership and vision is going to be tremendously helpful in this state. So I applaud you all, seriously. Thank you, Ron. Mm -hmm. Carolyn and then Kath. Yeah. Um, I hope this doesn't sound redundant, but I'm kind of a nuts and bolt person. And I like the idea of trying to break down the silos and when we have all the services like you've referred to, but how do we get those people on the same table with us to start really trying to do that? Or are we just going to say, okay, this needs to happen, get it to the legislators, and then let them try to break it down? From, from my, if, just to respond, I really think it's a two-step thing. We, we have you know, responsibility and authority over certain things, and we can make recommendations within our scope of authority. It's just that I see this year as a, a tremendous opportunity with such a, a change in the leadership. But no matter what, we're going to have a new administration, new <coughs> department directors, new, new, a lot of new legislators. And to begin the conversation with them, about the importance of integrating these functions and the cost savings that, that emerge if we think holistically about the people we serve, this is a time to begin that conversation with the hope that maybe a, 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 another, it's, it's too short of a term in this administration for this to happen, but in another administration there may be a look at what are the people's, what are the education function, <coughs> you know, what supports the child to learn, mental health services, social service support, Medicaid, whatever, what is that package, and how can we design it with the least administrative structure so the most is going to the teacher and the student, student at the classroom mm -hmm. level. So all I'm saying is to try to open that thinking beyond our borders um, to, for, to engage that conversation with the people that might be coming into office. But I think hearing Rob just a few minutes ago, it's so scary because... Well, we also have to do some things yeah. today, but yes. it, it, we know, can't I wait. That we <coughs> Kath and then Reggie, please. Speak. Yeah, I think uh, both Liz and Rob brought up very important points. I mean, the idea that, that we can lay on the table the fact that, that these things are not in the Department of Education or under they're in scattered around, and that's that's, that's and it's not only the education functions, but the you know the fact that the corrections budget is so huge and keeps growing, and the, and ours the higher education and K-12 shrink. Is that what people really want? You know, I don't think people really understand. They don't know all the facts, and they 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 should. We have to help educate them. But I think the 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 point that, <coughs> that Rob makes that. Okemos is one of the better finance districts, yeah. uh, and they're in such trouble. So districts all across the state are in trouble, and mm -hmm. they're all having to face layoffs and closing schools and doing things that they never thought they would have to do. 
and I think we have to recognize that this is a this is a crisis, and I agree that we have to do something. We have to push to solve to do something in the short term, as well as look at this yeah. new vision of education as a continuum that that I think is important to do in the for the long term. The structure seems to allow we, that. We structure things around mm -hmm. that, and I think we have to do something. I'd like to see us take some action, maybe before we, we could go into regular session this morning, before Nancy has to leave, and say, yes, we endorse this general approach, but we, not, every, not necessarily every single item, but the general approach, and we want to continue to do this. And we're going to go, keep going on this path. I think we have to make some kind of a statement to that effect. That we, you know, we just got this. It's Did taken a while to put this all together. <laughs> I mean, this is really quite a lot of work, and we're really grateful to the people that, that helped us do it. But we have to make, we have to pull it together and, and say yes, we endorse it, and we want to go on from here. Just procedural again. The board so want to consider general, the way you just described it, general endorsement. Are you comfortable with that, Nancy, or just a uh, statement? I, I, I guess effect? what I was just saying was that I want to, what I, what I think we could endorse is that this is um, of such import and such immediacy that we, that we support moving forward with coming to resolution mm -hmm. about this kind of a document, but I can't support, and I doubt that any of us can support it as it stands right now. Um, so I, I guess concept, that's what I would want to make. But not the details. Right. See, yeah. I'd hate right. to have uh, uh, <laughs> this be accepted today right. and then have it misinterpreted right. in the media right. what we're supporting. They wouldn't do that. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> 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 well, Jerry right would be there. the only problem. Reggie's <laughs> <laughs> voice. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think we're we're on the right track. Um, we we knew from the beginning that we would not be able to do this by ourselves, and I think we're at the point now where we've got the framework uh, for a discussion with the partners that we hope to, to work with. And going back to our original resolution, we said we were going to work with the governor, with the legislature, with other stakeholders in the process of of developing these recommendations. And so I think that we have a draft that is robust enough so that we should invite comment um, on it at this time and um, invite the, the legislature, um, uh, people, the members of the governor's administration um, and others uh, to, to comment on this draft. And I've been fr I would expand it to candidates, yes, uh, mm -hmm, frankly, um, for, uh, for you know, folks who are uh, hoping to lead our state mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in the, the next year and beyond, um, well, I'd like to hear their comments on this. Where do they stand on, on some of the ideas that are, that are in this document? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, let's try to elevate the debate. Mm -hmm. and, and I do think that, that your point about urgency is something that we should keep in mind. Um, and uh, as we get this out, um, I, I don't think that we should um, uh, think that this does have to happen <coughs> next year. Um, you know, uh, let's remember, Proposal A was 1994. Everybody thought nothing was going to get done um, in an election year. Uh, it was a gubernatorial election year just like this one. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Proposal A, you know, was a big dramatic shift that nobody thought could get done. And I think we have to, we have to be thinking, um, we're, we're in more of a crisis today than we, than we yeah. were in 1994 yeah, by far. Uh, so um, <coughs> we should be thinking about how um, to move this move these actions and and to play sooner rather than later and for no other reason than that you know we have a school year coming up um, in uh, uh, in the fall um, where <coughs> you know if some of these things are are um, are put into place they can you know school districts can begin planning uh, for some of these uh, uh, to, to implement some of these ideas if the support is provided for them to do so that's a great Ex idea. Excellent point, by the way, on the lame duck <coughs> nature of major change. It, it can happen. And in 93, mm -hmm. actually, it, it was, was December of 93, 93 right? mm -hmm. when they enacted a lot of this and got it. And, and, you know, one reason I remember this specifically is I had just resigned as superintendent in Farmington <laughs> to take the ISD superintendency at Wayne. Mm -hmm. And then at like, I don't know, December 22nd or whatever, yeah, we got just this. Just before Christmas. Right. It, it, it eliminated ISDs. <coughs> That, that one draft. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember looking at that thinking, what happened here in the last <laughs> four hours? Uh, 
I, I, let me just Nancy, make, please. Let me then. just make a real quick comment on we have a school year starting in the fall. In reality, we have a school year starting July 1. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that is of immediacy that we need to keep in mind as yeah. we discuss this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, could we say something yeah. combining what we just said? Uh, that's a great uh, offering, Reggie and Nancy. I mean, could we say we in, uh, embrace the principles and the general direction of this uh, set of recommendations and we are we continue the process of refining those recommendations but we now invite comment and participation from the leadership community on this uh, this framework right, yeah. but we don't endorse good. each item that's we that's what some of the members are saying right. they, right. they don't want to endorse right a carte blanche and inviting yeah, comment process. is really a, like yeah. an excellent yeah. way to think about yeah. this and maybe yeah. put a deadline of and the May meeting. I mean, people can comment in a timely way, right? In fact, so moved. <laughs> <laughs> Support. <laughs> the spirit of that, uh, so without say, the specific we provisions. Can we around that spirit? Yeah. Spirit and, and we, inviting comment prior to the May meeting and there'll yeah. be uh, um, more do, do we have to go out of the session? Do we have to go out? Do yeah, we I have to we do, do this affordably? Yeah, yeah. do it in session. Okay, let's consider that I did but that. I, I said, Eileen, that we embrace the principles and, and direction of this report and its recommendations. We uh, continue the process of refining th this, these recommendations and now invite comment from the leadership of our state, uh, however we want to define it on this framework and Public. by our May meeting. Let's start out with the word process first. Yeah. Okay. And how instead of the principles. And we okay. don't need the word embrace in there either. <laughs> too lovey well, I think we can't for you. Have embrace. Too cuddly. We are just <laughs> <can> embrace. <laughs> <laughs> Here, wait a minute. Support the process. Support the process. Yeah, support the press. Support the press. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I pulled this out of that one Support the process and, and embrace the, the principles. No, no, yeah. no embrace. Yeah. <laughs> no. Is that okay, what we're saying? No. Can you? I'm sorry. Why don't you, you take a shot at that? Well, I don't. Well, I said, I, I, I'm hearing that you're not sure you want to support the principles. Right. Is that right. true? Right. right. <laughs> so that's where that's where I'm struggling. So support the process. Right. And the general direction. Yep. The general direction. Yeah. We say direction versus general. That sounds too general. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, just say the direction. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Of the yeah. report. Well, what if and we, we, um, what if we did this? Okay. Um, we have these principles to guide district education system restriction that are the broad outlines. Um, and, and I can support. You're looking at page of, two. Yes, yeah, looking at page two, mm -hmm. and the and the rest of it is you know collectively these two documents together contain a variety of suggestions that uh -huh. seek to achieve. Um, uh -huh. The, the goals and these principles. Um, so we, I think we all support these principles. The principles and, yeah. and, 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 we, and we're placing the rest of this out there for the public comment yeah. um, mm -hmm. right. uh, to uh, get feedback on the specifics. You're talking about the educational principles. Right here on page yeah. 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 Let's Let's do Not the financial. We'll, we'll define yeah. that. Just the oh, here on this document. Yeah. Oh, okay. Not on the PowerPoint, the on the other. Okay. We'll define it as, as such. Yeah. In the we'll resolution. The education the title of it principles, right? As we attempt to move outside the box, we're going inside the box. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. we provided so all these nice right. boxes. That was <laughs> moved by right. John. Yeah. It was supported by anybody. By Reggie. Reggie. Yes. Right. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Great. And now we'll Great. go back into. Okay. Yeah, so Can I show you one more thing? I mean, some people ask why should we care about higher ed in our job K-12. I think we collectively are right in saying we need to look at the whole education system. For those who haven't seen it, this is the relative increase in higher education budgets over the last 12 years. Uh, you can see Michigan is 49 out of 50th, and there are lots of other states that are equally financially strapped in here, including that we compete with who are figuring out a way to support higher ed more as a priority, as a budget priority. And so it's just a reminder that this is what we've been doing. Right. <coughs> Thank you so much yeah. for this leadership. Yeah, thank you, and Thank I think you very it's, much. Yeah, give us, really let's give yourself a hand on that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I think what we'll do is um, we need to break from 11.30 to 12.30 today uh, with Nancy uh, leaving at 12.30. So we're, why don't we just do that now? But if yeah. we could pretty quickly 
move back to our room. I think Eileen said there's some. Yeah, lunch is here. Um, it's in the office next to me. But we have to have a, a roll call vote to go into closed session before we break. That okay. is on page nine. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay, we didn't get to page nine. Okay. But <laughs> okay. So we need a motion to go into closed session. Uh, so moved. It was moved by Nancy and supported by Carolyn. And that requires a roll call vote. Sure, hmm. Austin. Okay. <laughs> roll, roll in favor. No, it's got to be roll call. Mike. Roll, roll call, call okay. John, to Liz. go into closed session. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Liz. Liz. Mrs. Bauer. Oh yes. Mrs. Curtin. I didn't yes. hear what she said. Mrs. Danehoff. Yes. Approved. Mrs. McGuire. She's going yes. Mrs. Way. Strauss. Yes. Mr. Turner. Yes. Ms. Albridge. Yes. Okay. So we'll go into closed session and then we'll be back for the audience at 1230.